Hey, so today I am joined by Nick Diggins, who's a mindfulness teacher in Brighton. And hello, Nick. Hello, Gerald. Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, so... <coughs> Excuse me. That's okay. You teach, you teach mindfulness in Brighton. Are you from Brighton? Um, well, I've lived in Brighton for 30 years, so right. uh, I think it's a bit more than 30. 1986, so, yeah, it was 30 years, yeah, so okay. uh, originally from East London. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. And you can just hear a slight East London twang in my voice, probably. <laughs> it's a little bit of Danny Dyer. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, how did you, uh, what was your upbringing like? It was not unconnected. To this um, sort of thing compared to many people. Perhaps. Yeah, well, um, I mean, no, no one in my family meditated, but uh, my when I I only realised this many years later, I remembered that my mum had um, she talked about Buddhism and enlightenment, and she wasn't practicing as a Buddhist, but she she later told me she'd read a book by um, Lama An- Anagarika Govinda. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's it's about Tibetan Buddhism essentially. And um, so I'd heard the, the kind of notion of uh, um, yeah, a kind of spiritual practice and Buddhist practice in my childhood, but my family weren't uh, in any way actually involved in any kind of meditation or, 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 or any Buddhist practice. But mm-hmm. I think that sowed the seeds for me. Yeah, you think yeah. maybe the door's a little bit wider open than... Possibly, yeah, yeah than, than it would have been otherwise. Um, but certainly from... When I was 15 or 16 onwards, I was fascinated with, um, I suppose, with human potential. My mother was a psychotherapist, or she became a psychotherapist in my early teens. And so I was very, um, I I very strongly had this conviction that it was possible to um, live more fully and more wholeheartedly and kind of resolve emotional blockages. And so that was the kind of background originally. Um... And then we we did a. Uh, she went on a, a, a kind of therapy holiday at the Skiros Centre in Greece, and I was a, a um, just you know, uh, I wasn't involved with that, but I, I went along on the holiday, and I met somebody who was a meditation teacher, and I went to his meditation classes, and then that kind of set the scene really for me to then get interested in. Um, the idea of meditation and awakening but it wasn't until much later when I was coming to the end of my university days that a friend of mine went off to the Buddhist centre and he said why don't you come along and um, um, yeah I mean as I'm saying this I don't want to give people the impression that you have to be a Buddhist or that that's you know um, sure. that's an essential part of mindfulness because the the fantastic thing about mindfulness is it's available to anyone from any faith or from no faith it's it's just about tapping into our human potential and resilience essentially mm. yeah but you did come to it through buddhism that's how i came to it so i was involved with the brighton well i still am but uh, i got involved with the brighton buddhist center in 1990 i did my first meditation course and I was going through an extremely difficult time, essentially a kind of nervous breakdown. I just finished my university days, um, a bit kind of lost in the world, going through a relationship breakup, and I found it very difficult to meditate, and and yet I, I kind of knew that that was the direction that I needed to go in. Uh, and it took me several years before I felt kind of steady enough in myself to start meditating and, get, and getting involved with going to classes again uh, and then not long after that I got very very severe chronic fatigue I mean I was, I was literally bed bound a lot of the time and certainly housebound uh, and gradually started to get out and about but um, in relation to that I had you know a lot of anxiety and periods of depression and eventually I did a, a mindfulness based cognitive therapy course which had a very different flavour and approach. I mean, it was at the Brighton Buddhist Centre by some Buddhist teachers, but it had a different flavour to the original meditation courses I was taught. And and I I felt particularly drawn to that style of teaching. Um, And then I supported some some classes for a few years, and then eventually I thought, why don't I train to teach this? So uh, Mm. that's where where it went from there. When you say it had a different flavour to the other courses you'd done mm. at the Buddhist Centre, presumably, mm. was that flavour down to the secularity? Not entirely, actually, because within the Buddhist tradition, there's lots of different ways of teaching mindfulness. 
Um, early Buddhism tends to more focus on um, well, I don't want to try and characterise it very, very, very quickly and briefly, but uh, broadly speaking, it's being aware of body sensations, thoughts, emotions, uh, in the breath, obviously, and more and more subtle aspects of our experience. But there's a there's more of a notion of progression and uh, an increasing refinement and cultivation of uh, more kind of skillful states of mind. Some of the later Buddhist teachings have much more emphasis on surrender to the immediacy of direct experience in the moment and letting go of any agenda. So within Zen Buddhism there's a strong emphasis on non-striving and non-attainment, which uh, seems quite different to, to the way the early Buddhist presentation of mindfulness, um, or some of the early presentations of, of mindfulness, I mean, Buddhist scholars might disagree with me on that, but certainly some of the ways I was taught mindfulness originally had much more emphasis on uh, trying to enter more refined states of mind. They're called jhanas. And um, this flavour that comes more from the Zen tradition, which I think is was a big influence on John Kabat-Zinn, of non-striving, non-attainment, and an open receptivity to the immediacy of this experience right here, had much more appeal to me. Um, actually, I could say more about that um, because I, I was extremely ill at that time and my experience was extremely unsatisfactory. A lot, a lot of physical pain, a lot of distress, no clear sense of things changing. I was ill for many, many years, in, in about 18 years in total, so this was early on in that period. And I was coming across teachings which were emphasising that freedom and a sense of being in touch with the aliveness and vitality of life doesn't depend upon improving your circumstances or even improving your mind or becoming anything or achieving anything. There's a possibility of opening directly to a vitality which is here irrespective of circumstance and that principle wasn't there in the way I was taught meditation in, in, in the early days and um, that's what's drawn me more and more in my life as I've got older is, is a confidence and trust that beauty and power and vitality and aliveness can be tapped into irrespective of our circumstance um, and there's much more of that within the, the um, MBSR and MBCT format. Yeah. Mm. I would imagine I, 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 that totally chimes with me what you mm. said. I would imagine that's an extremely challenging thing for somebody outside of this experience to to sort of understand. Really, well, I mean, just to to make it really practical and immediate. Uh, here we are. We're having a discussion about mindfulness. I've already said a lot of words, but if we drop into and anyone listening to this can join us in this. If you drop into your know, direct experience. There's the feeling of our contact with the, you know contact with the chair, uh, maybe your feet on the floor. There's the the warmth of our clothing, the ambience of the the room, background sounds, and um, I mean maybe particularly say if you bring attention to your fingers and feel the sensations in your fingers. What can happen is we, we drop underneath busy thinking into sensing and life can feel more rich, more vivid, um, certainly more peaceful. Now, um, it doesn't take any huge skill to be able to do that. I mean, the, the, the tricky thing is we lose it very quickly or it can be lost very quickly. Mm. Um, and granted, if you're in a lot of emotional stress or a lot of um, physical pain, it's, it's a challenge to do that. But it, my confidence is that, it, I, I am confident that it is, it is possible uh, under any circumstances to, when we meet and experience directly, to find a peacefulness even within very challenging experiences in emotion, sensation, pain even. Um, 
you say you were ill for 18 years mm. Mm. Um, but you, how much of that time was practicing mindfulness is, is that the whole time or? no uh, oh, it's, it always gets a little bit fuzzy trying to think back but uh, I, I got ill I think sort of 94 um, and um, yeah that was the spur for me to go back to meditation so right. uh, I think probably I started classes again 95, 96 something like I think it was 95 I started again um, little by little and so <clears throat> yeah there was a long period of time when I was extremely ill but still meditating as best I could I mean, it was pretty foggy um, yeah. was that ever a, a psychological challenge i.e. was there a temptation to think this will make me better but it didn't and um, well, uh, I mean, I just remember it was the whole time was a huge psychological challenge. I mean, life was a, <laughs> you know, uh, what, what, uh, what I experienced was a tremendous sense of fellowship and community and solidarity in being involved in that particular Buddhist, um, community. And this is the, yeah, the problem with the Brighton Buddhist center. Yeah. And uh, at a time in my life where I could uh, do virtually anything else, I couldn't really you know, I could just about get to places and then I would need to lie down. So I could go to a meditation class and lie down, but you can't go to many other places and have the, that sense of safety that you I'll can just... Up, up yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for me, it was a, uh, it was a refuge, you know, in a real, real sense, right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's really... Um... Yeah, that, that must have been extremely valuable. This whole sense of connection mm -hmm. and the human need for connection I think is is possibly uh, something that isn't talked about as much as it as it might be within mindfulness yeah um, well um, in a way I think that it, it, I'm, I'm not so sure about how things are talked about but uh, my conviction is that the connection is already there but it's it's missed or lost because we get so caught up in uh, the well in in uh, MBSR terms we call it the doing mode of mind you know the being busy with plans and objectives and judgments and expectations and so much so that we lose touch with the, not only our bodily somatic experience but the the the, the palpable sense in which we are already connected. Um, so, to my mind, mindfulness, I, I, I think the really tricky thing is it's very hard to explain what mindfulness is. It's something you have to experience, but most people who really engage with mindfulness practice find their relationships improve, uh, they find it easier to communicate, they find themselves less reactive, so that when people do say things that they find you know, uh, painful, they can weather it more, can see underneath what people are saying. Um, so my, my conviction is that mindfulness is, is totally about connection. Um, certainly in its Buddhist roots, in profound insight practice, which is essentially what mindfulness is, um, is about seeing beyond any sense of separation and alienation. That's, that's precisely what the whole path's about, is coming to a point of recognising that the notion of separation and alienation and isolation um, is a misunderstanding of what's really there. So when life is really seen fully, you, you could say things are interconnected. I mean, even that's not quite accurate, because to say things are interconnect, interconnected suggests there are separate things that are connected up. Yeah. yeah. But I, I certainly see mindfulness as um, about recovering our wholeness, and that means both our wholeness within ourselves, the different energies and forces and um, inclinations within us that may be at war, so finding a resolution and harmony there, but also a sense of wholeness with life, connectedness with other people, with nature. Yeah. How long have you been teaching? Um, I've been teaching for 10 years now. Um, it started in a little way, you know, uh, sort of co-teaching courses at the Brighton Buddhist Centre and uh, kind of gradually built up, um, uh, you know, eventually running my, my own courses independently. But, yeah. Do you see 
a lot of change in uh, what do you call them? Pupils, students, students. students. Uh, yes, yeah, students. And that is probably a fair word. Uh, do, you, do you see over the eight-week course, which I presume is what you teach? Yeah, yeah. Do you do you see a before and after? Yeah, definitely. Um, varies a lot from person to person. There's no guarantee. Partly. And maybe it's a question of when people come to it in their lives, but for some people, it's very dramatic. For some people, um, I mean, the eight week course really is a beginning, but nevertheless, in that time, for some people, a, a huge shift happens. Um, uh, for some people, it's more subtle, but certainly, uh, when people continue with practice, uh, you know, I, I mean, some people, uh, I'm not exactly sure that people would say lifesaver, but that's the impression I get when some people talk about what, what, what they've experienced, the shift and the change. People say to me, I couldn't possibly have dealt with whatever I'm dealing with now if it hadn't been for mindfulness. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, it's incredibly moving and inspiring. Um, some people who come back to my all-day classes again and again, I run classes for graduates, you know, people who've been through the course, um, and to see the shift and the change in people is very, is very, um, it's very, um, it's a real privilege. It's um, rewarding. It's incredibly. I mean, I couldn't ask for more job satisfaction. You know, re- really, truly. Mm. Um, that said, it really is important for anybody thinking of doing the course to have a realistic sense. The benefits, for one thing, only come through really doing the practice. Really commonly, people book on the courses and then find they, you know, they just don't get around to doing the meditation practices, and and then they're not going to get so much from it during the course. During the course, yeah. Right. Um, but also, it's very, um, it's quite mysterious and unpredictable where the fruits are going to come. Gem, it very often happens that people say to me, um, you know, so week five, six of the course, they say. Well, I'm doing the practices. I don't feel like it's much different. My mind's still all over the place and I'm not finding very concentrated. But my friends are saying to me, gosh, you've really changed, you know. And I, and I find that I, I feel calmer in situations and I don't feel so wound up about things. And So it can be quite mysterious the, the way the benefits manifest mm-hmm. um, sometimes. Sometimes it can be more obvious and dramatic. Yeah. One of the things... Um, put me off for many years mm. and contributed to my late arrival compared to how it might have been mm-hmm. was my perception of the kind of people mm. who I would have to be mixing with ah. which was a highly negative perception ah, yeah, um, interesting yeah, I'm quite curious uh, as to if you if you Obviously, you're in Brighton. Yeah, which yeah. Which is not a normal place. Yes, yeah, so it's already a little bit standards. alternative. Yeah. Um, are there is there a particular demographic? Do you think that come to your classes? Um, well, uh, uh, let me answer that question in 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 with on two sides. So on one side. I have taught people from all walks of life, um, you know, people from very privileged backgrounds and people from very impoverished backgrounds and people from all cultures. I, I do distance learning courses and I've taught people in Saudi Arabia, um, United Arab Emirates, uh, Jordan, uh, certainly European countries in America. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, uh, and it is absolutely clear to me that when we get to the nuts and bolts of our direct experience, there's a you know a fundamental human condition which we all share um so that is absolutely clear to me um and in my courses i do get a fair spectrum uh, of 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 people from different walks of life ha- having said that this is the other side to the answer to the question um i do certainly get vastly more women than men uh women see i i'm I've speculated what the reasons for that might be, but yeah, a lot less men come to my classes. Tends to be probably more middle class people, um, uh, and tends to be mostly white. Um, and that might be partly because of. Um, well, I'm not exactly sure why that is. It might be that my advertising would be would be a friend of mine said, you know, she teaches in London. She said she put 
pictures on her website of people from ethnic backgrounds and that immediately changed the demographic in her classes. So it might be that I, I don't present an image that's multicultural enough, I don't know. Mm. But, um, mm. That's um, interesting. Um, another thing I'm interested in asking you about is the kind of whole group thing, mm. which I wonder if, if that might be kind of off-putting uh, for some people. That, that could be, and that was my speculation with regard to why not so many men come to the classes, because uh, I, I think just in terms of you know, normal everyday culture, it might be that, and this, this, I might be completely wrong about this, but it might be that women are generally happier to come into a group and talk together. You know, uh, I mean, there's no requirement to talk, actually, in the classes. People don't have to, they can stay silent if they want to, but, um, but uh, my, my imagination is that some men might find that a bit challenging. Yeah. The reality is the group is one of the most common things people say at the end of the course is, I'm going to miss the group. You know, I feel almost tears in my eyes as I'm speaking to you here, and my heart comes up. You know, to I feel the sort of buzzy, tingly energy in my heart centre. The power and the beauty of of working together as a group to explore our experience is is humbling and incredibly beautiful. So, um, what happens time and time again? The classes start. There's a little bit of nervousness before long, especially the way I teach. There's quite a lot of laughter. But as we get into the nitty gritty of exploring what's going on and people start to, you know, honestly share things that are happening when they're doing the meditation, people again and again, it's like, oh, that, you know, they're like me. <laughs> That's what goes on for me. Yeah, I got that. And you start getting, technically we call it universalization. You know, they, they, people start to recognize what's going on for them isn't unique mm. um, and that we all share very similar challenges. Yeah. Do you think it takes courage to to turn up to talk about these things? I I do for for some people certainly. I have one person, a dear friend of mine, who did my course. She won't mind me saying this. She did my course. Um, she did it three times as a participant, and then because she was part of that Buddhist community, she became a supporter, and she then supported. I think probably thirteen or fourteen further courses. So she did in t- in t- I think she did in total. I don't know about fifteen courses or something. And the first course she did, she was so severely agoraphobic that her, her partner had to drive her to the front door and then it was touch and go whether she'd get in the building. And, you know, w- within a few courses she was... Um, I mean, I think even... I think the second time she did the course had more impact than the first and after that she was able to go on trains and, and buses and uh, and now she goes on holiday all over the place. And um, uh, so... For some people, it is a real challenge coming along. But that doesn't stay like that for very long. I think most people pretty quickly get a feeling that it's a nurturing, positive space to be in. I, I'll generally provoke quite a lot of laughter. Mm. You know, just the counterbalance is, can be very serious. And, you know, very um, we're facing the raw grit of our humanity. And joy and connection and, you know... I mean, some. I had one person say to me, um, "I don't know if there are more flowers in my street, or if I'm just noticing them more." <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. lovely. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that I found most intimidating mm. about the whole idea of, uh, specifically, actually, the first time I went to the Buddhist centre, mm-hmm. didn't know anyone who went or anything. Just mm-hmm. all I knew was what time to turn up. Yeah. And I worried that I would be us to sit cross-legged on the floor mm, yeah, yeah. in a lotus position yeah. and I worried uh, that the thing was an hour long and I thought what happens if I get cramped yeah yeah yeah. I, yeah I had all these kind of like preconceptions which are not helped by the fact that there's photos of people sitting in a lotus position overlooking a valley on pretty much every kind of yeah, thing yeah. you see you know? yeah well you you certainly won't find an image like that on my website. Right, um, it is, it is. <laughs> I mean, the the thing that is truly fantastic about this modern wave of mindfulness teaching is that it is completely accessible to people from Western culture. So we sit on chairs. I, uh, some, depending on the venue, I, I leave, give people the option of sitting on the floor, or, you know, cross-legged if they want to. Some people like that, mm. but most of us would be sitting on chairs. There's a tremendous emphasis on self-care and um, uh, doing what you need to do. So 
uh, um, a lot of emphasis on, uh, you know, if you need to move, just quietly moving. Uh, I'll say to people, you know, if if you find that you, you, your posture becomes very uncomfortable, maybe just sit with it for a little while. But if it becomes too strong, change position. If you need to lie down, you know, um, if you need to stand up. So the practice is about resourcing ourselves. And what is fascinating for me is how often, no matter what, how much I've emphasised that, people will not not choose to do that. And then they'll say, and I just felt really, un- I got really uncomfortable. And I say to them, okay, so um, do you remember me saying that it was fine to move? And they say, yeah, but I, I, I sort of, and then I say, so what was it that stopped you? And that can be really fascinating, exploring that question. What is it that stops us from doing what we need to do to look after ourselves? Most of us have been told as children, don't make a fuss. Mm. Or don't, don't, you know, don't stand out. Um, so it takes courage sometimes to do what you need to do. Yeah, and um, not, not just in the context you're talking about. In all, in all contexts. And yeah. this learning is transferable. If you learn that it's okay for you to quietly move if you're in pain, you may then build up the courage to say at work, would it be okay for me to move my computer because it, you know, the, the, it doesn't feel comfortable. You know, the, these things are transferable or in relationships. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Regarding the promotion of mindfulness, mm-hmm. um, it, it seems that there's a sort of, perhaps a grey area mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to describing the potential benefits mm. and having to be careful to, uh, you know, to not be like some kind of get rich quick. Yeah, yeah, sort of yeah, yeah. Do you do you um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's something I've reflected on a lot. Um, partly because there's such a big media hype uh, about mindfulness. Um, it's kind of understandable if something does. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of scientific evidence behind the benefits of mindfulness. Um, how uh, um, the tricky thing with scientific evidence is you can have evidence and then you can have counter evidence and you know over the years the picture can change and shift. But I think pretty much anybody would agree that there is evidence that mindfulness brings a range of benefits. Um, certainly in in my experience. I've seen firsthand that uh, I've seen mindfulness help shift people who have, who have difficulty with low mood, people who have anxiety, people who have social anxiety, people who have you know ch- challenges around work, um, general life stress. I've seen a big shift in people, so I trust that that can happen. Um, however, what 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 can happen is that people feel bad. They want to feel better. They hear that something can make a change, and then they latch onto it as going. You know, this is what's going to sol- heal my life and, and solve me. And I don't want to buy into that. So, um, on my website, I do present the evidence. You know that that um, I, I, I put links to the, some of the scientific papers, and I will repeat some of the broad outlines of um, the areas that mindfulness is known to help with but I also very strongly emphasize it's not a magic bullet there's no guarantee you know for any one individual how much difference it's going to make um, and I try and I always when people book on a course they either come to one of my talks or, or I'll speak to them one-to-one and I'll always kind of get a, a, a kind of sense of um, yeah, what people are bringing and uh, try and give them a realistic picture of how it might help mm. and, and what, you know, what the, uh, how it might help and, uh, but also not to kind of blow their expectations out of proportion. Um, yeah. So yeah, it is, a, I'm not sure I've entirely answered your question, but it is a tricky thing. You know, how do you present something to people that really might benefit them? Obviously, this is my livelihood, so you know I want to uh, make it widely known that people could benefit from what I do. But at the same time, it's absolutely vital for me to live with integrity because if I'm not living with integrity, that would sour my the whole 
kind of project of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I, um, it's, it's tricky, really. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? So, um, so certainly, it's something that I keep an eye on. And if I got to the point of, you know, if evidence came out that was very strongly against some of the things that I've put on my website, I would, I would change what I put on my website. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What about your personal practice? What do you? Mm -hmm. How has that developed over the years, or has it developed? Yeah, um, well, about ten years ago, um, I came across a teacher called Eckhart Tolle, who's, who's, who's very popular and well known. I was going to ask you about it. Yeah, and his teaching just blew blew my whole, uh, blew my mind, blew my heart. You know, blew things out of the water. And again, back to what I was saying earlier in the interview the emphasis on freedom being available right now irrespective of circumstance which is kind of central to his teaching I found incredibly powerful and beautiful um, and because of that um, my, my own practice has shifted much more into um, aiming to just sit and be op open and receptive um, I, I'm getting a little bit more technical now because uh, this is a um, slightly well it's very kind of complex um, uh, yeah with there's different there's different types of meditation within the Buddhist tradition and broadly speaking there's there's a distinction between what's sometimes called the developmental uh, or the progressive path where there's a notion of a meditator steadily accumulating wisdom and becoming more well becoming more mindful essentially and then what's sometimes called the imminence teaching or innatist teaching the idea that um, whatever we're really the freedom we're really looking for is innate um, and my, in my own personal practice, I'm much more drawn to imminence teachings or innatist teaching. It's a teaching which doesn't emphasise cultivation. The Buddhist word for cultivation is bhavana. So it doesn't emphasise bhavana, but emphasises open receptivity. And in my personal practice, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's what makes my heart sing most. In actual practice for people learning mindfulness... Um, even from pretty much the beginning, there's both of those approaches in there. So there's the there's the structured practices, which is mainly what we teach on the courses. But there's also m most structured practices will end with a period of just sitting in open awareness. And on my meditation um, list, I've added an introduction to sitting in open awareness so that people can get a sense of how you might do that. You know, you just set a timer and sit. Um, yeah, there's a bit more to it than that than I could kind of say briefly in an, in an interview, but um, just radically shifting into that non-doing, non-striving, you know, non-effort. Um, non mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, that's where my, in my personal practice is more orientated to that. Actually, there's one more thing I, th I think I need to say with that, which is in order to really do that in a way that you're on the ball with what's going on, I think most people need to be very in touch with what's happening in the body. So in my own meditation practice, that's really where my main focus is. Just sitting, receptive and open to what's arising, but particularly anchored in a somatic experience, the body. Yeah. Which is... Where the body scan is trying to take place. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the body scan is uh, uh, is exactly there to, to put us in touch with what's happening in the body. Most of us in the modern world live in our heads, you know. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, going back to that cartola, um, the, the power of now, mm. that, that really, yeah, that, that blew my mind. I just, mm. It just all fell into place when I read that. Yeah. And... Um, I thought it was very... Really, the thing that blew my mind most was this notion that you are not your thoughts. Yeah. Which is something that I just... had never occurred to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I, perhaps until it's pointed out, if you're not brought up in some kind of Eastern area, 
if you yeah. grew up in the West, then I don't think it does necessarily occur to you. Yeah. And I think that's uh, that's probably the most liberating. Well, the the interesting thing is that in a way that's right at the core of the uh, of the um, MBCT and MBSR. Um, well, the 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 theoretical underpinnings that there's a term psychologists use, which is metacognitive awareness. So this is, I think, fairly recently coined. So if you have a thought like, I'm a failure, um, which somebody prone to depression would probably have, and even those of us who aren't prone to depression will probably have thoughts occasionally like, oh, why can't I get it together? Or, you know, um, I don't know what, you know, something along those lines. Now, if you're practicing mindfulness regularly, you've got much more chance of recognizing, oh, here I am having my I can't get it together thought. Um, and that recognition that it's a thought and not an integral true aspect of, you know, is not, an, you know, not a, well, not a fact, that's what they call metacognitive awareness. And that's a big part of what makes the mindfulness courses effective. If you start to recognise, oh, these things that are going through my mind uh, are just like passing weather patterns, then you've got freedom. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to go off piece a little bit yeah. now, I think, simply because I can and because it occurred to me. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, it's my name. Um, if you are not your thoughts, who is the you that is thinking that? Yeah, that's a very... Um, that's a very... It's a very tricky question, isn't it? And um, I know you could. It's a rabbit. Yeah. Answer, it? It, well, it, um, uh, what what I would say is that I suppose I've got three answers to that. Really, one is that um, my conviction is that. Well, I mean, I'll give one of the other answers first. One one answer is that if you really want to explore that question, that's probably going to take you into more mystical territory. It could be that it takes you into more scientific territory if you know if, if that's how you find yourself answering that question. But I think to really answer that question is probably going to take you into into some kind of contemplative tradition. Um, where I go with that practice is that uh, the real you underneath is awareness itself, and that awareness is inherently compassionate, wise, um, responsive. Um, and universal do you and mean? universal yeah it's not you particularly it, it's it's the, it's the level at which yeah there's a uh, i mean here's this is where we start to sound like um somebody from those old kung fu movies or something you know <laughs> uh but yeah that's my conviction is that what's uh, what's really there in the background is awareness itself and that that is powerful and knows the correct response to every situation and um is resilient and so it's not like you kind of lose anything uh, but the third answer to that question is that I think it's important to be a bit careful in in addressing those kind of questions for some people because what what can happen is people come to the well who am I really and they can start to feel alienated and like well if you know uh, I, I don't feel like I'm anyone and uh, then if they're in a particular stage in life they can become a bit nihilistic and um you know, um, it it can be a, a very unhelpful. So, I think th within the uh, f community of people who teach mindfulness, generally we don't encourage people to explore those kind of issues because they it can open things up which are uh, you know kind of troublesome. But if if you have a natural fascination with those ideas, as I say, I think it will take you into a kind of more contemplative path. Mm, yeah. yeah. Um... I was talking to somebody the other day about mystical, uh, about whether you can have mystical experiences in all this. I don't want to go too far down this path, because mm. as you say, there is a, an aspect of it that could be unhelpful for some mm -hmm. people. But I would say I have had stuff that I can't really explain, mm. uh, experiences I can't really explain whilst meditating. Mm. No, nothing massive, nothing dramatic, nothing that's going to get me in the papers, but... Mm. Um, do, do you and, and I hesitate to use the word mystical mm. truthfully but stuff that I don't get I don't, mm. stuff that's outside my reference mm. area or whatever um, do, do you think that's uh, common? Ooh, um, or am I well, just a bit weird? 
Uh, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't say you're weird. I mean, um, I, I, it's difficult to know without without knowing exactly what the mystical experience was, and there's no way you could really communicate that to me anyway. But what what I would say is that, uh, yeah, it, it, in a way, um, probably most of us have experiences that are at some point which are outside the normal kind of you know there's just moments that feel incredibly beautiful or moments where you feel a sense of connection or something feels mm. vivid I mean for some people it's like you know they they see something an act of compassion and it just puts them in touch with uh, you know they say, oh gosh that really affected me I don't know quite how but that's this has really touched me or falling in love yeah um yeah, I mean, just tracking back, one thing I wanted to add to the last question you, you, you asked was, f for anybody who 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 does um, start to feel ungrounded or uh, like with the who am I question, you know, if that or if people start to, you know, I've I've known people, um, friends who've said, oh, I get have this feeling of this feeling like it's, things are unreal or I'm unreal or. With any experience like that, it's really important to stay grounded. And that's why the mindfulness courses have such a tremendous emphasis on body sensations, sights, colours, touch, mm. you know, really kind of grounding in the here and now. Yeah, it's way um, more down to earth than I thought it would be. Yeah, very, very only. So, yeah, those kind of mystical experiences can come, but hopefully they're in the context of feeling very grounded in the world yeah. as well. Yeah, which makes them or safer yeah I suppose yeah um, when he writes in the New Earth Cotolle talks about uh, it doesn't really use the word mindfulness does he but no. he is he's essentially kind of certainly that's well, I have the recipe heard, I have heard him say that the, the Buddhist the Buddhist word for this is mindfulness and his reservation about that is that it 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 it, it, well, actually, it's not the Buddhist word; it's an English word, mindfulness. But, but his reservation is that it conveys the notion of being more mind, yes. mindful. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, I think he's got a point. Really. Yeah, I agree. Um, he talks in this possibly the most. Uh, this is certainly the most kind of uh, uneasy question in terms of how I feel asking it. But mm. but at the same time, I think it's it's worth exploring. Yeah, sure. He talks in. An, in New Earth about the idea of evolution being uh, something that rather that happens gradually that can happen in kind of quick leaps when it's needed mm. uh, for instance animals coming to live on the land away from the water mm. and so on and so forth and he talks about this kind of presence and so on in the context that it may be what we need mm. as, a, as a species or perhaps as a planet mm. to uh, to avoid our imminent destruction in mm, various ways we're yeah. threatened. Do you do you think that mindfulness or presence or you know mm -hmm. whatever would be the best word? Um, do you think this stuff we're talking about has the ability to contribute towards changing the world? Oh, I I I I think absolutely. I mean, I can't say how it doesn't. The the um, what I mean, just to be clear, what we're talking about here is something very, very ordinary, you know. It, mindfulness, is, I mean, even if, if people haven't heard of mindfulness or they hear about it and they don't know anything about it, they will have had some experience of mindfulness. It's, it's just very natural and ordinary. It's about coming into our direct experience so we're not caught up in our judgments and expectations and worries and plans, but we're meeting life directly as it is with an open-minded, receptive, responsiveness, sensitivity. So this is very, very, it's not, in a way, it's not rocket science, it's very ordinary, but incredibly easy to lose. And most, you know, most people um, find it a surprise when they practice mindfulness just to realise how much like the mind is like a buck bucking bronco, you know, it's kind of going all over the place. So it can't help but benefit people and therefore those around them to, to become more in touch with you know the ordinary vitality of their lives now um if you take specific examples say one person the effect it has on them their family it's clear to me that 
one person practicing mindfulness has it ripples out, has a positive effect on the people around them. If lots of people are practicing mindfulness, that's going to be magnified, you know, a, 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 an equivalent amount. And who knows where it's going to go, but it certainly seems the case at the moment that large numbers of people are taking up these courses and it's becoming more widely known and um, more accessible to people from different walks of life, which I think is fantastic. And I feel like um, that's what I want to spend my life doing is sharing, joining in with that um, proliferation of, of this, you know, what I think is such a helpful teaching in the world. Um, yeah, it certainly looks like the world desperately needs change, and I, I, I certainly don't want to kind of present mindfulness as like the panacea, but um, I think it will be part of uh, uh, well, part of the remedy for the the way the modern world is. That sounds like a fantastic point on which to uh, on which to say thank you ever so much. You're really welcome. You're really welcome. Yes, a real yeah, joy really to come and uh, to come and talk with you. Thank you for yeah. interesting questions. And well. if people want to get in touch with you, do you want to? Tell yeah, you they can. Uh, well, they can get in touch with me through my website. My website is mindfulnessforwellbeing.co.uk. Mindfulness for wellbeing. If you just put Nick Diggins into Google, that's Diggins, not Biggins. Tell you a very funny story. I was in, living in a flat uh, in my early twenties, and uh, uh, one of the women I shared the flat with uh, came in in the evening, and she said, "I've been laughing all day." She said, "I heard you on the phone this morning, and uh, I heard you very indignantly saying to somebody, it's Diggins, not Biggins.'" <laughs> Yeah, you must love Christopher Biggins. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but yeah, you'll find me on uh, on Google. And um, just uh, for anybody listening to this, if you're looking for a teacher you, you, um, and you want a group in the local area and you don't live in Brighton, there's now a register called the UK Listing of Mindfulness Teachers. And all the teachers on the UK Listing will have had a thorough training and will comply with what's called the good practice guidelines so I'd really recommend finding a teacher who um, you know because there's an awful lot to teaching mindfulness is very 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 easy to teach mindfulness badly um, so find a teacher who's got you know a reasonable amount of experience and certainly a proper training and is under supervision and so you'll find either on the UK listing of mindfulness teachers or it's a bit difficult to find the URL for that uh, another way of doing it is going to the Be Mindful website. But certainly if you're interested in, if, you, if anybody wants to ask me any questions, you're welcome to get in touch uh, through my website or anywhere else. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Gerard. Sorry.